Amen. I've got a few. Everything. Not just some things. But everything is going to be all right. Amen. Thank you, brothers. If you have your Bibles with you on this Lord's Day, I'd ask that you turn with me to New Testament reading. And that is Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. And we're still continuing our, our journey through Colossians. But guess what? We're getting closer to the end. <laughs> we're getting closer to the end. And this letter has been a blessing. It's been a blessing. Could you signal that you have those verses by just simply saying, Amen. 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 I'll begin reading from the NASB. And this is what God's word says. Wives, be subject to, to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And the tag we're going to add on this text for this Lord's Day is true spirituality and marriage. True spirituality and marriage. Beloved, there is a TV station by the name of uh, TLC. And TLC is an acrostic for the Learning Channel. Some of you all probably have watched or watched uh, TLC. And uh, TLC has a show which premiered in March 23 entitled Seeking Brother Husband. Mm. Seeking Brother Husband is a spinoff of Seeking Sister Wife. Mm. And if Seeking Sister Wife is a man who is concurrently married to two or more women, which is called polygyny, then seeking brother husband is a woman who is concurrently married to two or more men. And we call that polyandry. And both polyandry and polygyny are subsets of what we commonly call polygamy. And although TLC has uh, a television show that exposes or puts before us, those who watch TLC, polygyny and polyandry, what we must understand is that God's view, God's plan for the institution of marriage is neither polygyny or polyandry, but instead monogamy because monogamy is the marriage of one man to one woman and what shows like seeking sister wife and seeking brother husband tells us is our culture has made a mess of marriage yes our culture has made a marriage as it as it was intended and designed by God himself it also demonstrates our culture has become even chaotic at times in its definition of marriage. But saints, check this out. Marriage is sacred. It's, it's sacred. It's not to be entered in by wimps either. <laughs> marriage is sacred. It's a sacred union and an institution created not by men, but created by God. Well. Created by God between one man and one woman. One woman. And although marriage is sometimes jokingly described as a, a three-ring circus, you all know about that, right? First there is the, the wedding ring. Or, should I say, first there is the engagement ring. That's the first ring. Then second, there is the wedding ring. And then third comes the suffering. <laughs> 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 oh, no, marriage is 
jokingly described as a three ring circus. We know that marriage is not a three ring circus because God Himself has established marriage. God performed the first wedding ceremony in Eden. Well, and he brought Eve to Adam. And Adam responded in Genesis 2. He said, this is bone of my bone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from me. Mm -hmm. In other words, thank you, Lord, for this gift that was tailor-made just for mm -hmm. me. My God. And so no matter how our society attempts to confuse and redefine marriage, mm -hmm. biblical marriage will never change. It's always going to stay the same. And the truth is, y'all, is we need strong marriages right. more than any other time in our culture and our society. We need to see strong marriages because strong marriages lead to a stronger society. Well, Strong marriages lead to stronger families. Strong marriages lead to having stronger churches. Mm. I believe Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 10 verse 9. He said, what therefore God has joined together. Mm -hmm. Let not man or don't let anybody separate what God has in fact Join together because when God joins a man and a woman together in marriage, mm -hmm. it is designed to be a lifelong commitment to in sickness mm -hmm. and in health until death does yeah. its part. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, it's hard. I was telling my wife, uh, I was showing her a video about a family that I came across. Uh, where this husband, this wife, and this, this young child were together and they were dancing and they were celebrating. But then as the video went on further, it showed the wife who had to undergo chemotherapy. And in spite of her having to undergo chemotherapy, that husband remained committed to his wife. See, marriage as God has designed. Right. It's designed to be in sickness and in health. Not just in good times, but in the bad times as well. Not just when you're on the mountain top. Come on, come on. But yeah, it's, it's when you're going through the dry seasons of the valley in the marriage as well. See, it's hard to do marriage in sickness and in health when we have, when we enter in with the co-parenting mentality. See, because when we enter into marriage with a co-parenting or let's go in half on a baby mentality, see, when, when things get rough, yeah. see, nobody has no skin in the game for real. Mm -hmm. And the only people that end up suffering is the kids who are in between. So it's easy for those two persons to step away and say, listen, we can do co-parenting. But really, y'all, kids need to see our children they need to see husbands and wives being committed to one another oh through the good times and even through the bad times. Because when a husband and wife come together, they yoke up together. They yoke up together and they work together as a team to build something together. Well. That's right. We, we building something together. You know, this, this is not about my stuff versus your stuff. This is our stuff. This is not about my house versus your house. This is our house. These are our kids. This is our money. Uh-oh, somebody said, uh-oh, we talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing all right, Steve. He started talking about our, our money. <laughs> and so the husband and wife, although two separate, unique, whole persons are one in Christ. Mm -hmm. Because in marriage, the two become one. 
In marriage, the two who have become one work together to bring glory to God through the marriage. Well, in all that we do, even in the context of marriage, it's designed to, to bring glory to God. And so when it comes to the verses that we read this morning, Paul has given us some instructions for both wives and husbands in the practice of true spirituality within the context of marriage, the marital relationship. And I'm just going to say this from the outstart. If you are a couple and you got kids, young kids especially, it's important for couples and young kids with, with young kids not to become child-centered because the most important relationship in the marriage, in the family, is the relationship of the husband Amen. and the wife. Amen. Because far too often in the grind of marriage, I can speak as one who has been blessed to be married almost 30 years, in the grind of marriage, when there's young kids, we can get so caught up in taking this kid here, this kid to this one, this kid to this appointment, this appointment, that appointment, that we forget to take time out for one another. Amen. And so marriage is like a triangle. It's like a triangle in that at the base of the triangle, in the corners, you have the husband and you have a wife. At the tip, the top of the triangle, there is Christ. And as the two come, Together, as they grow, they grow closer together in Christ. Well, and so when we reflect upon these verses that are before us this Lord's Day, especially as it relates to true spirituality and how we have been unpacking true spirituality in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is now dealing with family relations. And in the context of laying aside the old self and putting off or putting on the new self, if there's any <laughs> unit where this is to be reflected at more than any other unit that we see on the planet Earth, more than any other relationship that we see or we are in on the planet Earth, it is within the context of the marital relationship. We ought to be, there's some things we ought to be putting aside, putting to death, laying aside, and there are some things that we need to be clothing ourselves with in the context of marriage. Because what we are trying to do in marriage is build not just mere houses, but we're trying to build homes. Because as the, the late Luther Van Dross once said, a house is not necessarily a home. Mm -hmm. And so both husbands and wives ought to be putting on hearts of compassion towards one another. Oh, Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other as the Lord forgave oh, us. And putting on love as the glue that holds all those Christ-like characteristics. Oh, found, if you all recall, in Colossians 3, 12, 14. But yet, even more importantly, husbands and wives ought to let the peace of Christ rule in their hearts. Having spirit filled speech towards one another and being thankful. See, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be able to get some tires that or have a, have a car that gets down the road in marriage and to look back and thank God from where he's brought you from. Amen. You know, you're building something together and you can get 15, 20, 25, 30. Some of us in here, we've been married longer than that. And you can reflect upon what God has done in and through your marriage. 
shit. In the good times and the bad times. You know that's something to praise God for? That's something to thank God for. So we need to be thanking God for how he has seen us through in marriage in the good times. And how he has seen us through in the bad times. Because those who get married will face many troubles in this life. And so marriage is an all-encompassing expression of doing everything we do within the context of marriage that the name of Christ may be glorified and honored. Mm -hmm. So marriage is important because we live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. And the reason we live in a fallen world points all the way back to Adam in Genesis 3. And because of Adam's disobedience, the whole world is marred by sin. So, church, listen. Husbands and wives have a tremendous amount of responsibility. And even we as the body of Christ, the church, ought to be doing all that we can to undergird and support those who are in biblical marriage. Because the statistics are alarming. Today in the United States, over 41 to 43 percent, near 41 to 43 percent of all first marriages end in divorce. The statistics get even bleaker when we look at second and third marriages because in the United States, 60%, nearly 60% of second marriages and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. It, it's estimated that each year that approximately 1 million children are hurt, traumatized by divorce. See, divorce even impacts not just the children, but even the extended family where bonds of friendship have been established. And, and, and the truth is, I mean, can we just, we in church, can we just call it how it is? The, I mean, some of the reasons why folk are getting divorced, they don't have anything to do with Scripture. My God. You know, uh, she, she don't communicate well. He don't communicate well. So we need to get, we need to get a divorce. You know, we, we're incompatible, whatever that is. I'm still trying to figure that out. What does incompatibility mean? Because, you know, I'm still trying to figure out stuff about my wife, and we've been together since high school. You know, some people try to fake and say they've been together since high school, but my wife, we've been together real deal since high school. We got pictures to prove it. We got receipts. We got we, we got junior prom receipts and senior prom receipts and, you know, hallway school picture receipts. But we've been together. She, you know, she's been my boo. She's been my ride or die since high school. And, listen, I'm still learning things about her as the years have went on. I mean, I ain't mastered that yet. So, and, and understand this, when I stand up here and I'm preaching on marriage, don't think that I got this marriage thing lit. All right. I don't have a certificate on my wall saying, hey, you have met all the necessary requirements to have a successful marriage. This, this, this certificate is conferred upon you by the constituents of the marriage university. I don't have this thing clicked at all. So don't take that when you're hearing me talk about marriage because I still, as a pastor, have room to grow and am growing and learning how to do marriage the way God has prescribed in His Word. So a lot of divorces are for unbiblical reasons. And listen, we need not to be fooled by what we see on TV either. Yeah. Because there is no such thing as a perfect marriage. <laughs> they don't exist Amen. in real life. <laughs> perfect marriages don't exist. See, it's one thing to be dating somebody, or as an old fashioned word, court. You know, you're court. You're court. You hold court, you know. And you you know, you always see them at their best when you hold court. When you court. <laughs> court. See, you see them at their best. You know, when, when you 
get married, you find out that uh, one of them may snore. Amen. <laughs> yeah, one of them may, you know, one of y'all may snore. One of y'all may, you know, get up in the morning looking like Medusa, you know. <laughs> one of you may get up and your breath smell tart. Mm. And, you know, they want to lean over and say, hey, good morning. Good, yeah, good morning. <laughs> So, you know, there, there's no perfect marriages on the planet Earth. We all got some things to, to grow in. There's no such thing as a perfect family. Nah. Both husbands and wives are sinners who have been saved by the grace Amen. of God. Amen. And so both husband and wife are doing the hard work of growing in holiness learning to reflect the biblical principles of marriage within the context of the home. And that's hard work. That's, that's not easy work. That's, that's hard work. And so marriage, like a car at times, can become imbalanced or out of balance. And when marriage is out of balance, it's verses like these before us that help bring marriage back into balance according to what the Word of God says. Well. And so, in verses 18 and 19, the Word of God has instruction for wives and instruction for husbands, how they are to relate to one another in marriage. And the, the instruction is straightforward. Wives, be subject to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And, and let me say this. When I have counseled with different couples over the years, when there is a breakdown in marriage, in the marital relationship. When there is a breakdown in the marital relationship, I can usually come to these two verses right here and say, okay, is his wife being subject, it's, uh, subjected to her husband? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify that in a minute because I know that. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, sisters, I look, the ladies, look, they see their eyebrows. I mean, y'all can't see you, but you know. <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> There's usually a breakdown in the area of, you know, wife being subject to her own husband, and really, the stuff, the behavior that the husband reports back to me is really symptomatic of the, being subjective, being subject to her own husband. So, you know, that's that's usually when he when he says, well, you know, she she don't want to, you know, she don't want to, uh, you know, she always want to, you know, give me all this word for word and argue all the time mm. and. And so that's really symptomatic. The communication issues are symptomatic of, uh, you know, a wife not wanting to be subject to her own husband. When a husband is not loving his wife, really what, is, what we see is the symptoms. Him being withdrawn, wanting to hang out with his buddies, right. being short with his wife, or sometimes what I have learned over the years is sometimes it's tone. You know, we may have said the right thing, fellas, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it's the way in which we said the right thing. It all has to do sometimes with just the tone in, in the way we say it. So keep that in mind. So one, this, this, this text teaches two principles. One, wives be subject to your husband. Two, husbands, love your wives. And when it comes to wives being subject to their husbands, I <coughs> culture, the culture outright rejects it. You know, we have a radical feminist culture. We even have an evangelical feminist culture inside the church that view what Paul has before us as oppressive patriarchy and uh, instead ought to be read through the lenses of uh, 21st century relationships in marriage. And so they believe that this, these verses cut 
against the cultural grain of, of uh, our modern culture's sensibilities regarding marriage. Yet, beloved, we must never forget that, that Paul is not writing about his opinion in, regard, in regards to marriage. Paul is writing as an inspired writer of Scripture because we read this morning in Sunday school, 2 Peter 1.21 tells us that no prophecy of Scripture was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So Paul, when he talks about marriage, isn't being a male chauvinist. Neither is he trying to hold women back or treat women as inferior to men. After all, it was the Apostle Paul who said in Galatians 3.28 that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither female nor male or male nor female for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Right. In other words, all believers, no matter <laughs> their ethnicity, no matter their social status, no matter their gender, are of equal worth and equal value before the Lord. And so, when Paul write something about marriage, and I believe Paul to be authoritative, his words authoritative, and I believe Paul to be an inspired writer of Scripture. When he writes what he's saying here before us, it's as if God is speaking through him to us. Wow. And so when God speaks through the pages of Scripture, we have the responsibility to obey it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to even obey those sections of scripture that we struggle with. Those sections of scripture that we, that, that really sometimes when we read it on the surface level, we struggle to understand it and even apply it to our daily lives. But again, notice subject, or as he unpacked this in Ephesians, he says, submissive is as fitting in the Lord. In other words, what Paul is saying, the Lord is pleased when a wife submits to the loving leadership of her husband. Did y'all hear that? Mm -hmm. Loving leadership of her husband. Because to, to be subject, it comes from the word hupo tasso, Hupo meaning under, tasso meaning to line up or get in order. So in the house, I'm talking Christian houses, mm. in the Christian home, God has established order. He's established order, and that order is, is that husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church, and wives submit themselves to the loving leadership of their husbands. And wives submitting themselves or being subject to their husbands has nothing to do with a woman's inferiority. Well, And it also has nothing to do with a man's superiority. Because really, the person who submits is actually showing more strength than the person she is submitting to. Well, I mean, the authority does not come by a man just merely being a man. Mm. The authority comes from God. See, there is submission even within the Godhead in regards to role function. Although there is equality in essence, the Father sends the Son, but both are equally God. The Son submits to the Father, yet both are equally God. And so the wife submits to the authority, the headship of her husband, yet both husband and wife are of equal worth and value before the Lord Jesus Christ. So y'all getting that today? Come on, come on. See, a wife doesn't have to submit to to everything her husband says. Well, hey, I'm going to clarify that. She don't have to say, so, so listen, husbands, we can't throw down, you know, you just need to be quiet and be a submissive wife card. 
just because you disagree with something that your wife is saying. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw that card down every time. And so a wife <clears throat> submitting to her husband doesn't mean she submits to everything her husband tells her to do. Because there may be some things that, that a husband may tell her to do that doesn't have anything to do with Scripture. For example, if, if a husband tells his wife, you can't go to church, mm -hmm. she don't have to submit to that. She don't have to submit to that because you know why? You have just, we have just put ourselves in between God and our wives. See, our wives' first allegiance must, allegiance must first be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so anything that we as husbands are saying that runs counter to what God has prescribed in his word, our wife does not have to submit to that. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a problem with our wives understanding what it is that we are communicating, then that's when we got to open up the word well. and explain what we are trying to say based upon what the word of God and make sure that what we are saying based upon the word of God actually lines up with what the word of God says. Well. Because a wife's allegiance is to the Lord first. And a husband's leadership or headship over his wife is not absolute. Because husbands, we are fallen individuals. Right. And we can give or be wrong about some of the things that we do. Amen. And when we are wrong about some of the things we do within the context of the home, it is up for us to be man enough to admit that we were wrong mm -hmm. and repent and ask our wives to forgive us for being wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, a husband's authority over his wife is not absolute because husbands ought not to be in the business of abusing their, their wives. They ought not to be in the, be, the, the, the business of abusing their wives either physically or verbally. Scripture does not give a husband the right, the authority to abuse his wife. If a man is abusing his wife verbally or physically, he is out of step with what Scripture says regarding marriage. Mm -hmm. And that is a cause to repent. And so, a husband must never be in the position of leading his wife into sin. We must never be in the position, and I say we, we must never be in the position of leading our wives into something that is sinful because, you know what? When we stand before the Lord, we're going to have to give an account. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh yes, our wives are going to have to give an account, but we're going to have to give an account too. We're going to have to give an account to, as to how we have dealt with the gift that God has given to us. Well, because lest we forget, marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And lest we forget as well that marriage brings glory to Christ. And so husbands, we are commanded to love our wives and not be embittered against them. And to be embittered against our wife is to treat, is to treat them harsh. Treat them harsh. Be harsh in our, our tone, as I said earlier. Be harsh in the way that we, you know, that we just deal with them on a bit. Just be angry and mean and bitter. You know, listen, I always say this. If we want, as husbands, a summer wife, we can't bring home winter weather. <laughs> All right. If we want a summer wife, we can't bring home winter weather. If, if we want to love our wives, then we can't call them honey 
and treat them like they are or like we are vinegar. We have to love our wives. And the picture of loving our wives is the picture of Christ loving the church. So, listen, husbands, we can't expect our wives to perfectly submit to everything because our Savior, although is the Savior of the body, who is perfect, the Savior is perfect in all his ways, has a church, which is the bride of Christ, well, who doesn't submit to Christ perfectly. We don't submit to Christ in everything the way we ought to. And let me, let me say this, wives, neither can you expect your husband to love and lead you perfectly in everything. Because no matter how good he may be, even on his best day, he'll never be able to love you like Jesus. Amen. He'll never be able to lead you like Jesus. So listen, when a husband loves, in verse 19, it's a continuous action. It's something that is we something that we got to be working at every day. Hence, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Marriage is hard work. We work at learning to love our wives throughout the lifetime of the marriage until death does its party. And this kind of love for our wives is a dying love. It's a love that is dying constantly to the self. It's sacrificially selfless. And so husbands, as we're growing in sacrificial selfless love, we're learning to die to ourselves. And what this means is, is we don't just give our wives our time, our talent, and our treasure. We are giving our wives ourselves. Well, we're giving them ourselves. That's who we're giving. And, and practically, what this means is, as husbands, we can't neglect to be the family priest over our homes. Yes, I may be y'all pastor, mm -hmm. but your husband is the family priest over your home. Mm -hmm. And as the family priest of, of the home, the husband has a responsibility to make sure that we are exposing ourselves and our wives to biblically and doctrinally sound teaching from the Word of God. And so, if we don't believe that the Word of God as husbands is God breathed, why should we expect our wives to believe it? Watch out, Pastor. If we don't believe that the Word of God is inherent, why should we expect our wives to believe it? If we don't believe that being in the church on the Lord's day is important, mm -hmm. why should we expect that our wives would believe that being in the church on the Lord's day is important? If we don't believe that the word of God is our authoritative and sufficient, saints, we ought not to expect, brothers, we ought not to expect that our wives are going to believe it either. Mm -hmm. And so listen, as we get ready to draw down our clothes, ultimately, when it comes to our responsibilities and our marriages as, uh, as husbands, and I put the emphasis on husband because as I told a young man a few months ago, he was going through a winter season in his marriage. And the way he was handling this winter season in his marriage was becoming more and more argumentative. His tone was becoming more and more harsh with his, with his wife. I mean, what he was doing and what he was saying wasn't necessarily wrong, but it was the how he was going about it. So I posed a question to this young man. I said, listen here. Based upon way, the way you are behaving at this particular moment, let me ask you this. If Christ would come and knock on your door and ask, can I speak with you? Do you think he would be pleased at that moment?
moment that he came and knocked on your door with how you are treating your wife. Mm. And he couldn't really say anything. Just a, a silence. And so I say this to say that uh, men, most of the responsibility for how the marriage is going to go is going to fall on our shoulders. Mm. It's going to fall on our shoulders. And ultimately, when it comes to our responsibilities in marriage as husbands, let me explain it to you this way. We need to be more like the last Adam instead of the first Adam. In other words, the first Adam was created. And the last Adam was the creator. Mm -hmm. The first Adam needed to, to be sustained. And the last Adam was the sustainer. Mm -hmm. The first Adam needed to, to be forgiven. The last Adam is the forgiver. Mm -hmm. The first Adam needed to be saved. Mm -hmm. The last Adam is the Savior. Amen. The first Adam made a selfish decision which cast the world into sin. Mm -hmm. And the last Adam made a selfless decision mm -hmm. by dying on the cross for our sins. The first Adam brought the condemnation upon the entire world. The last Adam brought eternal life into the world. The first Adam straight died with his bride. But the last Adam died for his bride. And in case you haven't realized it yet, the, the last Adam is Jesus Christ himself. And God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unless we forget to that, that unless we forget this, the, the, the core of what Christianity is about is not about looking within ourselves, but it's about looking to a hill called Calvary yeah. to find out what God's love is about. Yeah. Because it's at the cross that we find out that our God is a merciful yeah. God. Yeah. It's at the cross that we find out that our God is a loving God. Yeah. It's at the cross that we find out that our God is a, is a gracious God. It's it's at the cross that we remember and realize that our God is a forgiving God. It's at the cross when husband and wife take time to reflect upon the cross that they find out what the essence of marriage is truly about. For as the hymn writer said, at the cross, at the cross, where we first saw the light and the burden of our hearts roll away. And when we think about what God and Christ did at the cross, all we can say is glory be to God. Glory be to the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. Thank you. Because the truth of the matter is, although those who get married are going to face many difficulties, oh yes you will. Although the culture tells us that uh, we need to forsake marriage and just be single. Yeah. Listen, you need to get married. There's nothing wrong with marriage. Marriage, marriage is a beautiful thing. Mm. There's nothing wrong with getting married. Although we made a mess out of marriage, it doesn't take away from the beauty of marriage. Mm. So listen, we ought not to be dismayed. Well. Whatsoever betides. Because God is going to take care yes, yes. of you. Amen. Beneath his wings of love abide because God will take care of you. Listen, marriage is not a human thing. Marriage is a God thing. Marriage is from him. And marriage is lived out through him. And marriage brings glory to him. And to all the glory belongs to him forever. For the Lord is great. And he's greatly to be praised. Amen. From the rising of the sun mm -hmm. to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Because he's done marvelous things. Yes, yes. He's done wonderful things. And he's worthy of the praise. God bless you.
and may heaven continue to smile upon you. Perhaps there's somebody here today who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. In the forgiveness of their sins, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Christ, you can just come talk to me after the service.